Good afternoon, and as we say in Greek, Kalispera. And I will ask the minister to say that again in Greek, and then our exceptional uh, panelists to say that in India. Okay. So we can have both languages. So, Minister Kalispera. Kalispera Alitsa. Good afternoon to all of you. Namaskar. Namaste. <laughs> namaste. Namaste. <laughs> okay, namaste. So, namaste in Greek means here we are. <laughs> <laughs> namaste. <laughs> we are all that. So we did um, a good start. And thank you all of you for being here. And especially after lunch. Which is great. Because if it was before lunch, it wouldn't have been so nice. Because everybody would, was going to look forward for us to break and to go to lunch. <laughs> so you had the lunch, you are here with us. We have a very, very interesting plenary. And um, I thank very much the organizers. And it's a privilege for Greece to host the Indian Forum in Athens. And thanks to Frank, Mr. Frank Richter for being a real organizer and put all this together with the Indian, the Hellenic Indian Chamber, Chamber of Commerce. Because they are all together. Correct? Correct. Yes. Correct. <coughs> OK. Now, what we have to, to discuss uh, here, we have a panel that is going to ensure that the, our session is in uh, is as, in, as uh, so powerful and possible to really uh, di to discuss how both countries what they are doing with the digi digitalization, with the bureaucracy, with all the things that they are a kind of pains in both countries. And um, I wanted, you know, just to, I could have a very long introductory speech, but I rather prefer my excellent uh, panelists to just uh, speak more than I do, because these are the people they are going to inform us of what is going on in both countries. Very quickly, I'm going to present my uh, people, and I will start from the minister. Is uh, Minister of uh, Digitalization and Development, Mr. Dimitris Papastergiou, has a very, very long history in the Greek society, because uh, in his uh, honest preview, <laughs> previous uh, life, has uh, served as mayor, and especially in a part of Greece, which is the part of Greece that uh, all of us, the Greeks, looking at, because it was the very first uh, piece, uh, part of Greece that was digitalized with uh, excellent use of technology and so on. He can speak to you about that for hours, but. I think he will speak about what he's doing today, <laughs> not, not uh, the, the other things. Now, to my left is uh, Mr. Ameya. Ameya is there. Ameya is there, OK. But we can change seats. Yes, 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 you change. Yeah, the the yes. names are there. Yes, so she, I'm sorry. Yeah, you have to sympathize with me sometimes when I'm mixing up with the, with the names. And it's Mr. How do you pronounce it? Will not. Okay. Could you just say what exactly you are? What? I mean, what is your role? <laughs> 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 I just well, said the minister. Yes. Um, I head the India SME Forum as its president. Okay. Good. And then I'll go to the lady. Because yeah. it's not, uh, you see, the two ladies were sitting at the, at the edge. <laughs> you and have our lives are and you, between women. And you have to <laughs> notice that. And when you are talking about men and uh, women, etc., 
there there's equality. Absolutely. <laughs> so you see, we are protecting the three of them. And uh, we have uh, Vanita, Vanita Dasha, Datla, Balta, yeah, so okay, I'm... is the vice chairperson yeah. and managing uh, director, Helico Healthware Services Healthcare, Syndicate. Healthcare Services Limited, yes. And he's, she's yes. going to explain more to us. Yes. Last but not, not least is Armeya Pradu. Prabhu, yes. Okay, yes. sorry about that. Founder of NAFA Capital India. Yes. And I'm going to just put the very first question, and I will ask, and that question is for all of you, and uh, you, have, you will have as well your opportunity, if you like to say some more about your position, so what exactly you are, please do. Uh, according to this beautiful Close. stories, yes. to my <laughs> right left, sure. sometimes look at it, <laughs> although we have Frank to tell us about the time on the as well. Uh, let's use about three, three minutes for the very first question. And the first question is, what level of digital transformation has each country achieved so far? And this is a common question for all of you. And uh, we just pay respects and uh, kindly ask the minister to start if he likes. So, namaste, kalispera. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here today. It's a very special occasion because uh, it's very important to discuss with people from India, uh, a huge country with huge history uh, that uh, we really feel very close to Greece. Well, in Greece, despite the fact that we have a very important uh, IT industry, uh, it is a matter of fact that uh, it was the private sector that till, uh, let's say, five years back, it was leading the whole uh, trial about uh, digitalization. As you said, Elitza, my previous life, with my previous hat, I was a mayor, and till 2019, I was feeling that we are trying to run and we're running on our own, because the state, uh, Greece, uh, was trying very hard to, to catch us. But it was this government, and this Prime Minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, who from 2019 took a, a very strong decision uh, because he was a minister uh, at his previous career, and he did uh, what he was thinking. He said that the only way to go faster uh, uh, towards a new future for Greece is digitalization. That's why my predecessor, Kyriakos Pirakakis, started uh, designing all the new uh, route towards uh, digital Greece. And it was the pandemic that helped us and worked as an accelerator about uh, this uh, effort. We saw, and uh, we saw that it could work, that all those things that in our minds uh, was working, we said that in Greece we cannot make it happen. We cannot uh, break the silos of data. It was just uh, a silly thought. In just two years, uh, the Greece, Greece and the, the Ministry of Digital Governance managed to uh, be an horizontal uh, ministry, tried to collect all the data from uh, various uh, points of the government. Also, uh, with the huge opportunity of RRF, Resilient Recovery Fund, uh, fund the funding for uh, very serious projects, just like, for example, in health, the health records, injustice, uh, the digitalization of all the folders and locations of justice. Uh, we started from 2019 constructing infrastructure. I have to uh, stress out that in 2019 we had 0% penetration of fiber optics in Greece and now we are running a very fast uh, speed and we have already cut 40% and we are still on building infrastructure. We also changed, and this is something that we can work together, our space policy. Greece it was somewhere uh, in space with a telecommunication satellite uh, from September, and due to all the very difficult situations we faced uh, with uh, climate crisis, with the wildfires, we redesigned our space policy, and now we are ready to start building our uh, future in space with 15 uh, new microsatellites. 
Uh, we also started with uh, the digital wallet. Now all the certificates, driver license, uh, our identity, our cars, our uh, insurance uh, condition is part of our wallet. It is very important now, now day by day, Greek citizens are see that digitalization of state, not just the theory in uh, the mind of uh, electrical engineer uh, minister, but it is something that really changes uh, its life. So it is important to continue step by step and day by day trying to bring digital Greece uh, for all of the Greek citizens. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I have to just add, as a Greek citizen, that uh, I can uh, verify what the minister is saying is that we, as citizens, we are in joy. And every day is something different. And I know because uh, the minister is uh, by his studies, etc. And because I know and I have cooperated with him years ago, is uh, an engineer. Electrical engineer. From the uh, Technical uh, University, University of Athens. Athens. And always, you know, with, if somebody has a technical background, is uh, carry on with that, and is a great, uh, a great uh, help. And uh, what I believe, all of us we try to do, is at the end of of every day to have citizens online and not in line. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, this, and this is the minister, and I believe that is my question for all of us, the question that's addressed to all of you, that is, this is the aim of every country right. about the citizens, that if the citizens are happy, they carry on. So, I'll, uh, instead of going to you, I'll go to the lady, okay. to the other end. So, Vanitha, what, do you, what is your response to that question? So, thank you, Minister, for giving us a brief background on the situation in your country. And um, it's a little bit more, uh, more deeply penetrated in our country, in India, because almost 10 years back, our government decided that we should go digital. And so, there was a huge initiative called Digital India, which the the, the federal government really uh, you know, pushed forward, uh, encouraged every stakeholder in society, whether it was the individual, whether it was corporate, whether it was community, whether it was governance, whether it was the government. Every stakeholder, I think, had a role to play in it. So it was building up the infrastructure, it was training the talent. It was also adoption of a lot of the technologies. So as an individual today, if you ask me how has digital impacted my life, for the last 10 years, I've rarely gone to the supermarket because I've been able to buy everything online. Um, there's something called quick commerce, which people have been referring to in the earlier panels, where if I'm at my cooking station and I miss one ingredient, I look up my app and I get it in 10 minutes, under 10 minutes. Um, I haven't gone to the bank for any of my banking needs in the last almost 15 years because everything is done, all my transactions are done digitally and online. So this saves up a lot of my time, which otherwise I would have had no, to spend in going to these places and getting in line, as you know, Litsa mentioned. So a lot of the waiting time, a lot of the commute time has reduced and that has allowed me to put that time into better initiatives, into better efforts, into a better quality of life. So I think the bottom line is if digitalization can create a better quality of life for every citizen and resident in the country, I think that improves the quality for everybody. And I mean, um, there is also red, uh, less red tape, less bureaucracy, hopefully less corruption, because I'm sure humans always find some sort of a loophole to get you know, into those areas. But this has actually created a lot of fair and transparent means and mechanisms where everyday life becomes more simpler for its citizens and residents. So that's my take on digitalization. And uh, of course, we're expecting more. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we are expecting more because uh, we live in the time <coughs> of uh, technology and AI and chat GPT, etc is in our lives, 
we are not going, although AI is nothing new, it's existing since, since 1971 Absolutely. or 1973, but right now is in our lives. So we're expecting the digitalization <laughs> to be more. And thank you for what you pointed out because it's the, the citizens every day. And Vinod, well, um, let, me, let me put it into perspective a little bit. We're talking about numbers. So from the morning, we've been hearing this number of 1.4 billion people. Now, 1.4 people, billion people need services. They need support from the government. They need schemes and all the other things that we normally expect the government to provide. Now, how do we do that? If we do not digitize everybody, if everybody does not have a bank account, if I can't send money to the other guy without having five or six people in between, including you know, contractors and bureaucrats and officers and so on and so forth. So how, what do we do? Well, the first thing is to clarify who exactly are these 1.4 billion people. Where do they live? Uh, can I uh, have biometric identification of everybody? So we started doing something like that. And we ended up uh, biometrically identifying 1.38 billion people. So today, we have the world's largest database of biometric identified uh, de denominator, which is basically this one individual, the citizen. So once we had that, we said, how can each one of these people access the public digital infrastructure that we are putting in place? So uh, I remember when the Honorable uh, Prime Minister came to power, and one of the, in, I think the first or the second week, there was an ad of one of the operators of uh, digital services, and it had the PM's picture on it. And everybody said, look, the PM is already sold out to this company, he's promoting them. Whereas the truth dawned us on us later when what we uh, had anticipated is maybe three, 400 million people <laughs> would go online with the sort of services that were under the net of this digital India. What finally happened was 898 million people were connected through the internet. So we have the world's largest number of people that use the internet, 898 million. There's still some left, obviously, yeah. you know, which are in the rural hinterland, those people that don't have any idea what, you know, what is internet and all of this. We also put in place broadband services, which were high, high intensity, tech-based, mostly fiber, at various places, and the number of broadband connections in India, which can give you speeds as high as 300 Mbps, are almost 900 million. It's more than the number of people that are actually using internet. Yeah. So, that's number one. What do you do with this situation that you've created with millions and millions of people on the highway? You know, like Vanita talked about, you order supplies, so you have all sorts of e-commerce, quick commerce, people germinate and do all of, all of these things. On the other hand, you know, we're talking about a country of close to four, 14 million, uh, 140 million, sorry, enterprises. Now these are enterprises that are micro, small, medium, all over the country. Large enterprises in India are less than 100,000. So that's the entire spread. And when it comes to taxation, you know, when it comes to taxing people for whatever they are making money in, you know, what sort of business they are doing, only 1.5 crores, which is 15 million people, actually are registered in tax. So you see this huge gap between the people that are actually uh, registered for tax in their businesses and the ones that are not. There's, I mean, there's a huge number of people that are outside this. So what the government does is, uh, says, let us help you um, get money. How long can you operate on cash? So let's help you get money. So we've got this uh, system called the Unified Payment Interface. Now what does that do? It takes a second to transfer money from your mobile phone. It's actually not from your mobile phone, but it's from your bank account to my bank account. And without the Visa or MasterCard or Amex or Diners. It's a direct protocol connecting your bank account to my bank account, securing it, and sending money. 
So today, yesterday when I came um, and I took a cab from the airport and I asked him, how can you, how do you take money? He said, cash. I said, and? So a lot of prodding, he said, card. But if you land in Delhi and ask the taxi guy, how, will, how can I pay you? He says, this is the QR code. Mm -hmm. You decide how you want to pay me. So it's just a QR code which is acceptable um, on GPay, all the other payment operators that are there. Now, what's essentially happened? All of these people that have businesses but do not have GST numbers, we are able to trace exactly what is the, the amount of money that they make every month because majority of them are now online. They are taking money through this U UPI system. And we have a situation today where we have digital banks and the fintech companies working together to offer lending to these guys who had never ever even think, thought about getting a, even a single rupee from anybody as loan because they had nothing to show. Absolutely nothing. They were all operating in cash. So that's one end of the business. You know, I'm a uh, um, SME representative, so I need to put that uh, in perspective first. Now, when we talk about UPI, what sort of volume are we talking about? You see, last year, uh, we were talking about 13.44 billion transactions. 13.44 billion transactions in a month. This year, we've aced it by another 40%. We've gone to 15 odd billion transactions. By volume, we have increased uh, by 55%. So in terms of the number of amount of transactions, those transactions, when we look at, have gone to over $250 billion a month. This is all happening without a single person, a penny going to Visa or MasterCard or anybody else. Now, there's this arbitrage. So if we don't give this arbitrage to people, who does it, who, who, who gets it? It's basically the sellers or the benefits automatically passed on to the buyer itself who is paying primarily. So that's one side. Second side, when we talk about, uh, we talked about governance. About one more minute. Okay, one more minute, cool. So we talked about governance. See, unfortunately, the uh, things in India that are happening are so vast that I, <laughs> there's no way I can cover it. I, I tried sitting through lunch and trying to make a list of things, so it's, it's well over two pages. But anyway, uh, so what I'm trying to say here is governance. The government put in place a system which said no more buying by tenders and inviting tenders. It's a very tedious process. It takes 60 to 90 days to procure anything. So let micro, small, medium enterprises register on a platform and whatever we need, we'll buy from there. And so today we have uh, a system which, where from where the government buys uh, stuff equivalent to $52 billion every year from 1.4 million registered enterprises. This all happens transparently. There's absolutely no waiting. There's absolutely no delay. And the government offices are able to handle this in less than seven days with the material delivered or the contract executed. So, you know, the way digital has reduced bureaucracy, it's also reduced um, corruption, and all the other things that are stemming from it. I think um, when a country as large as ours can do it, I'm, I'm sure, you know, I'm extremely impressed by the Smart Cities program, for example, here in Greece. That's doing exactly what we have been trying to do for the last couple of years, and we, we are quite successful at it. But, and it doesn't need, uh, uh, I think, a lot of money. I can share with you all of this infrastructure, which is digital, private, and inf public infrastructure, has been put in place with an investment of less than $290 million over the last seven years. I can say <laughs> that listening to all these numbers, <laughs> the only I'm thinking I had was that uh, India has, it's a huge country. How many, uh, what is the population? 1.4 billion. 1.4 billion, oh, okay. And that makes me feel a bit better because Greece is coming pretty close to 11. <laughs> <laughs> the neighborhood of Greece. 11 million. 
And uh, comparing of what we have been doing and what we can just take from you and how we can have a cooperation will make our, uh, our job. Minister, I'm sorry I'm speaking on your behalf about that, but as a citizen, I would have loved to listen to something like that. I'd love that. to run tenderous just like you said, but it's impossible. <laughs> but, For EU and Greece. The, but but these are the things because if, if a country achieves all this, that is better not only for the citizens, but for the investors and uh, the, the picture of the country in order to just uh, go along with the progression. And Amelia, I'm coming to you. I kept you as the last because the next question will, will st I'll start with you. So, do you have anything to add to that, or shall I go to the second question? Maybe why don't you ask the second question, and I'll take both together. Probably. Okay. Yeah. That's saying yeah. that, and this way we'll yeah. just benefit of yeah. the time. Yeah. And the second question is, what will we be talking about? Bureaucracy is a challenge in every country. Yeah. And we never even, with your achievements, we cannot get rid of that. <laughs> Still, we have things to do. Uh, what has been uh, the impact of digital transformation on bureaucracy? Thank you. And uh, sorry, um, Minister, but I'm starting the other yeah. way. Amega, uh, you can combine both. Yeah, thank your... you. I think, uh, firstly, uh, uh, Mr. Minister, I think the fact that uh, Greece has a, a Ministry of Digital Governance, I think that itself shows the focus of the Prime Minister, who, by the way, his visit to India was one of the most successful visits by a prime minister to India and has actually really given huge impetus to business, trade, interest in doing stuff between India and Greece. And I think, uh, so the fact that you have a ministry of uh, digital governance itself showcases the importance that you are presenting. And I think that, you know, in addition to being the founder of Nafa Capital uh, and we are an asset management motor uh, and other, other businesses, I'm also the president of the Indian Chamber of Commerce. We are the oldest chamber in the country. and. I think for me, I have a firm belief that governance and digitization also has huge meaning when it impacts the poorest of the people. And I think it impacts the last mile of society. So while, of course, as Ma'am said, and as he said, I think uh, while quick commerce is great, I'm a user of quick commerce, you know, Swiggy, which is a, a company, or Nike, I mean, we have a lot of unicorns now which are also listed, are great. I think one of the great successes of digitization in India has been its impact on the last mile, on the poorest people. Number one is, today, because of that, you have bank accounts for all. We had something called Jandhan Yojana, where every person had a bank account. Because of uh, UIDAI, which is a unique identification, apparently we've done almost 70 billion identity verifications in India today. This is when you get a bank account. We have something called DigiLocker, where all the documents can be saved in one place. And today, when you go to an airport, you no longer need a ticket or when you load a flight in India, you don't only need a ticket. Your face is your ID. You stand in front, you go straight all the way to the plane. So I think what government has done is it has actually truly democratized digitization. And when you democratize digitization, sorry, I have a bit of a cold, you actually reduce bureaucracy and you actually benefit the people because Absolutely. actually digitization is the highest form of democracy, according to me. And I think being in Greece, the cradle of democracy, being India as the oldest democracy in the world, I think the greatest impact, and I think, again, we'll commend the minister and the prime minister for focusing on digital governance. I think that's very important. A few points I'd like to add. In focusing on democratizing digitization, India has the largest open API in the world. So the entire India stack, all of what I mentioned, ONDC, which is a stack for e-commerce, Beam, which is a stack under NPC, our National Payments Corporation for digital co for payments. All of this is our open APIs. Anyone can use it. And I would encourage you, Minister, to do the same because truly these are national assets. And when you give it to your people, we should always give it to the people for free and they'll make wonders happen with that. So I think the other point is, you know, when I look at the US, the US, when you go for an election, you don't need an ID. When you, you, when you vote in the US in an election, they have manual ballots, which they go and then that's all the... No, India has not had manual election for the last 25 plus years. When you have the election within a few hours, and by the way, we are a very complex country. There are places in India when people go to vote, it takes three, three days to get in the deep forest, you know, to go. And I mean, I'm from Mumbai, where it's very easy to go and vote and people are, you know, take it as a holiday. But in these villages, 
in these remote villages where people have to brave rivers and forests to go and vote, they vote and that vote is calculated in less than a millisecond. And I think that is truly digital democracy, that you can bring it to the last mile. And the other thing is, today because of these payments, because of the fact that we have last mile ability on, uh, so you can go to almost any part of India. And today, you, and he represents the SME sector, but before SME we have another M, which is micro, which is the real, real small business people, you know, a lady selling momos, a person who knits some wool and sells it on the road. Recently, I was in Northeast India, in a place uh, further down from Darjeeling in the state of West Bengal, where Mr. Rajiv Kaul also comes from, our former president of CII. There, an old woman, she was probably 80, sitting on the road, had some knitted wool and had some shawls, and I bought them for my wife, for my child, for my friend. And I had no cash, I have a problem, even, I never carry cash. And I could pay her there, even, I had, and even in this deep mountain place, we had 5G data and I could pay her and this is truly digital democracy and reducing bureaucracy because this is how you increase incomes at the last mile. And I think that's where, if you ask me why am I proud to be Indian, is it my 5,000 year history, is it my demographic dividend, is it my growing economy, is it the fact that today we bring three things, right? We bring investment, we bring labor and we bring technology. No other country can do that. Maybe China but we also bring democracy. So I think that's something which is very important. So, I'm very proud of my country because we are benefiting the poorest of the poor through digital democracy. And I think, again, I would really commend the minister and the prime minister for what your focus on digital governance because that's the only way we can ensure that democracy, which is under threat today in many parts of the world, remains robust. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, and with the new technology and the new things uh, right now, you, I hope that pretty soon you're going to just bridge that gap and get over. And uh, by talking about bureaucracy, are you feeling that uh, there is bureaucracy still and that you have a lot to do on, especially in at your profession, but even in your everyday life? Right. Because you mentioned about the supermarket and the banks, etc. So the bureaucracy kicks in when, especially from the corporate sector, when you look at uh, renewals of licenses or you need permits and permissions to maybe scale up your organization or set up a new organization. So today, most of the states, and we have a, a structure where we have the federal government and we have the state or the regional governments, and a lot of the subjects fall maybe at the federal level, maybe in terms of environment, or you have the state level in terms of taxations and, and the local taxes. A lot of them, I can say uh, with confidence, is, has been digitized. And a lot of the governments actually have come into power because they have said that <coughs> there's less government in your interaction on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you are an enterprise, you're trying to set up an enterprise, government wants to interfere less in that, in the way that you set up your own company. And by this, I mean um, all your permits, all your licenses can be actually uh, accessed online. You can hit the ground running. You don't have to wait for certain departments to give you permissions. And a lot of the, star, the progressive states in the country actually have actually won their elections based on these promises. And they continue to uphold these promises by not allowing too much of bureaucracy into these day-to-day -day operations. Also, when you go forward, when it comes to labor laws, when it comes to talent training, a lot of government initiatives and schemes are there that actually empower and encourage corporates to actually help in training uh, their um, talent and employees. It helps in bringing diversity, uh, not only to the workforce, but also to the board level because we have certain mandates in place. I think government has a single-minded focus to enable uh, digitization across uh, sectors yeah. and across levels. So if you talk uh, about the SME sector, which needs a lot of hand-holding, we have a lot of organizations. Uh, for, the, uh, for the record, um, I was associated with the Confederation of Indian Industry, and we have certain focused programs where we do handhold the SME sector on their digital transformation journeys. So you have a number of association, a number of industry forums that actually help the SME sector especially to get more digital in their technologies, in their adoption of technologies, in their processes, enabling them to access wider markets, maybe export markets, helping them uh, simplify uh, 
renewals of licenses and permits. So a host of, uh, a host of uh, services can be actually accessed through the digital uh, no, uh, pathway. Thank you. And I've um, been listening to all that and knowing that you have to go to the latest, to, to the smallest part of the country because they don't have across the country the facilities of internet, etc. You have anything to add? Well, but uh, uh, again, yeah, just yeah, sure. look at the I'm time be about because I have the minister <laughs> and I have some yeah, he has questions. To speak last on the subject. Yes, I kept the minister in order to listen first of all <laughs> what you are doing and then to, to carry on about democracy and to, to expand on that. Lovely. So, uh, you know, uh, the only thing that I'd like to add to what Amai said and uh, what Vanita did talk about, you see, I, I said there were 888 million connections. What, what happened to the remaining? There were 600, 600 million that don't have connections. So how do these guys come online? Who offers him this democratized service? We set up uh, 400,000 common service centers. And these are all in the most remotest of areas. Because that is where 65% of the Indian population lives. And they don't have access to all of this. And what do these service centers do? 350 services, right from registration of you know, birth, deaths, pensions, all the regular schemes that are there. And each of these CSCs that we call them, common service centers, also work at the lowest form of government that we have in villages, which is called the E, E for digital primarily, Panchayat. Panchayat is the format, which is the lowest um, body that you can get elected to at a village level. And these are all automated using these uh, CSCs. Now imagine, we have ensured that not even those ones that say, I don't use a mobile phone, I don't know how to you know, access an internet, I don't have means to do that. Even to those people, this is accessible. And the fact that I have all of these people that have bank accounts today, which means when I'm talking about schemes, we have 400 schemes where the poor people, um, whether it's healthcare, food, food security, multiple number of schemes, where we need to transfer them some money or the other. But today, because it's uh, digitized completely, so there's no local self-government department which is handling it and signing checks or dig digging out cash and you know, spreading that around. Instead, it's money which is going directly to the account because we have connectivity which is end-to-end -end for all the beneficiaries that Amay was talking about. So essentially, when we talk about bureaucracy, the fact is we are reducing the number of steps, reducing the interventions that the government and the bureaucrats need to make in order to approve or disapprove or pass on the benefit. So, which essentially means digitization is a good means to actually cut the number of people that are working in terms of the layers in between. Okay, thanks a lot. Minister, we Please, got sir. quite an input <laughs> here of what we are listening. And if we speak about bureaucracy in Greece, of course it's not what used to be, no, no comparison. Still, we have some way to go. And of what you, all of you presented, still there is one more thing that I didn't hear, or maybe you didn't mention it, that is uh, the citizens in the third level of age, that they need very special training, although in our country has, that has started, so how we uh, compete, because the real expression and word is compete <laughs> with the bureaucracy. There is no, for my, for my point of view, there is no other expression but compete with bureaucracy. I'm not quite sure that it will come a time that all the countries, including US, they say that they have no bureaucracy. I don't believe that. I might be wrong. Well, let's start from saying that uh, bureaucracy is the mother of corruption. And that's why several times we saw in the past that 
when we were trying to digitize organizations, sometimes we found we were finding obstacles from the same people of the organizations. It is also a matter of uh, being there and have their organization. They own the data. And what they are saying, I will sit over my data yes. and uh, I will not give those data to anybody because that's why I'm here. The first step was the, the most difficult. It was to break the silos, as I told you. The second uh, reason that we have to bite bureaucracy is that Day by day, we saw that citizens are feeling that uh, the governments uh, don't feel them as part of their daily duties. And there is a distance, a distance that gives uh, space to extreme voices to be, heard, to be heard louder. That's why we have to always have in mind that we have to find digital ways to bring citizens closer to our governments. What we did in Greece, it was back in 2020 when gov.gr, the digital uh, gate of Greece, was issued with the first 500 services. Now, after almost five years, four years, we count more than 2,000 digital services. Uh, the reason is very simple. Uh, you don't have to be moved to CSC. As you said, it is the cap. We said cap in. In Greece, you can do on your own, from your mobile, from your PC, your jobs. And it was uh, gov.gr, the one that kept uh, Greece alive during the pandemic. But now, we are following the next step. And the next step is to find and bite digital bureaucracy. Because what we did, and we are, were obliged to do it like that, because we had to do it fast, we just took uh, a procedure from the paper directly to a digital format. But for sure, this is not uh, the issue. The issue is now that all our systems are uh, interconnected and they speak each other, yeah. just like you said, from the one side to the other, just to take a message. And this is what we did this summer with uh, the insurance market. You take a notification to your wallet while uh, the, it says that the organization X wants from your side those data to finish this procedure or your claim yet you asked. Do you consent? Yes, I consent. So this is the next day in uh, Greece uh, public life and uh, public digital service to stop issuing certificates. It's not a matter of being in a paper or in a PDF yeah. format. You Absolutely. don't need certificates. Exactly. What the paper was in the back, when the data was in a book, the paper was the network, yes. and the data were with the ink written in it, on it. Now you have all this interoperability. You just need it to consent due to GDPR, which is very strict in the EU region and Greece also. So if you consent, your job can be done in very few seconds. This is what we are trying very hard to do uh, in parallel with all the other apps that we do, because it is very important, the Prime Minister always says that we don't just need technology, we need technology to solve uh, problems, daily problems. For example, we uh, this year made a very funny but very usable app for the coasts. You know, in Greece we have a, a beautiful coaches, but we have a problem with occupancy of coaches with a lot of umbrellas and seats. We did a very simple app where a citizen can see if the place where he wants to go for, for swimming and uh, uh, wants to sit, uh, it's legally occupied or not. But it was the first step to bring technology and make te technology more inclusive for everybody and be part of this transition towards a digital era. For sure, just like you asked, you need, we need to have in mind that uh, there are a lot of citizens that uh, cannot use mobile or they don't want to use mobile for reasons that they know. That's why we also are keeping our caps, the same senders with, that you have, uh, just uh, to give the opportunity to all those people to be part of this, this <coughs> without using in, uh, real technology. But we have to be, uh, not to use degrees of two speeds, but for sure just to think in mind, have in mind that 
we don't have the right to leave anybody behind. Okay, unfortunately, nobody can stop that. I can do because yes. the guys are my friends. Stop that we, can carry, we can carry on for another hour or so. So we, we have to be very, very, very quick for the rest of, of what we have to discuss. And there are so many things that we, we can discuss about this subject. Uh, I'm not going to ask the third question. I'm going to take it as a statement. And uh, I can say that uh, I strongly, after what we discussed, uh, uh, believe that uh, the governments of India and uh, Greece, they are, quite, they are going to be quite sure that the digital transformation and the new technologies, they are going to be continue uh, driving, uh, for driving force for growth. And uh, I believe as well that uh, with AI, if we use it the proper way, even what I, I mentioned before about the third generation, et cetera, uh, will be faster learning. And all country, all, every country around the world, they are in a great uh, luck right now because of the younger generation and the startups. Because the startups, they don't do anything else, but they're using the latest technology and the developments. And even we can start having kind of robots trying to teach all these things. So quickly, one minute each, because we have the closing. Uh, what strategies are needed to unlock productivity and secure long-term economic growth, after all we discussed, and how? India and Greece can cooperate and benefit of the achievements of each other because we might be very small, but we have achieved some things. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not, I'm Absolutely, not, no doubt about it. I'm not so, going to, to, the, to our histories because Absolutely. you have philosophy, we have philosophy <laughs> as well. But I'm saying that we have achieved few things. So I'll start with you, one minute. Sure. And, and then we look at that. You know, um, or very, very one, quickly. One and a half. Yes. Okay. Um, a, you know, from the position that Greece is today and what the rest of the world looks up to, you should be having a digital sustainability hub. It should be a world um, uh, first sort of an organization which can talk about, uh, which can do research, uh, develop tech, uh, stacks on climate change, efficiency, all of that. So that should be, I think, one of the things that um, I was talking about. Second is, you know, uh, we, while in my own session, we were discussing, uh, India did a project with Google. It was digitized most of our ancient art, uh, the statues, all the temples, and all the other traditional stuff that we used to have. It's still ongoing project. It's only maybe 10% done. But something like that, where you can use VR, AR, you know, because today, if I go to one of the ruins, I don't know how it was 3,000 years back or 4,000 years back, but we can all recreate it. And you can have visitors see that, and they can pay with I'm going to show you an app. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, so you exactly already have that. it. Yes. Excellent. Uh, the other one that I was talking about is a Mediterranean tech corridor, mm -hmm. which should connect all the countries here, which could also create an innovation hub, which could also house an uh, incubator. For example, enterprises that want to come to Europe via Greece, because Greece is Europe for us. And if we were to set up, let's say, three, 4,000 enterprises here, people would come, um, get a space. They could also work on research, development, innovation, all the tech, tech guys that we have. You see, a small place like called Bruno, which is in the Czech Republic, border of Vienna, um, Austria, and Poland, houses 14,000 Indians. It's a speck of a village. So we can have something very, very similar here. And with the sort of tech expertise that we have, I, I'm very sure, if nothing else, at least half of the southern India would love to move here because it's the same Mediterranean climate. My one minute is over. Thank you so much. <laughs> Minister? So, First of all, for sure we can uh, continue discussing because we're widely open in uh, collaborations and we for sure admire India, uh, India culture and India people. 
I see that there are, in addition, two more areas we can work together. First of all, it has to do with cyber security. Yeah. Uh, those are common challenges for all of us to work together. And the second one has to do with AI. Greece is in a crossroad between uh, three continents and uh, now a lot of cables, energy cables, uh, com cables are passing or are landing in Greece. We also, next year, we have already our new HPC, high performance computer, which could be the heart of our AI ecosystem. And uh, we also have the talent, because there is a study that was saying that uh, Greece's uh, scientists are 11% of the uh, greatest uh, scientists of AI all over the world. So uh, if for sure have the will to work together, uh, we have some infrastructures scaled to our needs. We have the data because now we digitize more than 1.8 billion uh, documents. It's a huge amount for us yes. in Greece. Uh, so there is no reason not to continue discussing. Uh, there is a, such a good uh, feeling between the two countries. Uh, the space also uh, projects uh, are very important for us because now we're building our own capacity. So let's keep on uh, discussing further for our common future. Thank you. Amaya, the one uh, minute. Sure. Uh, so I think a uh, few points uh, which I think one needs to address. One is, uh, Your Excellency, if I may say that uh, we've had a lot of success in India in digitization, in creating unicorns. In, uh, so I think if even at a government to government level as well as at a business to business level, maybe on the business side, enterprise Greece could also take the lead from the government. I think it would be great to see how a lot of our learnings can now be incorporated. So what the Indian government is now doing is we are actually globally exporting the India stack to various countries and also in Europe, incidentally, Singapore, Sri Lanka, <coughs> Middle East, UAE, also to Europe. So I think that would be of great interest, I'm sure, for our government. And if you are visiting India anytime soon or maybe we would request you to visit India, I'm sure that as the Indian Chamber of Commerce, we would love to host you and also set up a lot of your meetings with uh, various uh, entrepreneurs with various business people, but of course, and government, I'm sure, are, uh, we have a fantastic ambassador here. I believe you also have a great ambassador in India. And uh, I think that could be something very interesting to see how we can collaborate. Secondly, Your Excellency, I think uh, what could also be interesting, and again, I speak more from an Indian point of view, though, is Indian tech startups are now going global. They usually use Singapore as an arm for going global. Some of them use Middle East as an arm for going global. But at least from a Europe and Africa point of view, if you can maybe promote Greece as, or I mean, I know as 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 a uh, launch pad into EU, I think that could be very interesting because I think EU is, go I mean, especially now with the EU India FTA being in the advanced stages of closure. Recently, India closed an FTA with the uh, other grouping, which is Switzerland, Norway, Luxembourg, uh, and Iceland. So I think that could also be interesting. So I think these are strategic place that one can look at, but I think that's where you and your ministry and the government can come in. Yeah. So, uh, I'm a lot of been, yeah, yeah, to save the yeah. time. I think I'm the only one who stuck to my timeline. <laughs> <laughs> because, so a, lo yeah, yeah. a lot has been talked about the population that we have in our country. And in fact, the city that I come from, uh, it's close to 10 million, and that's almost the population of your entire country. Now, in such a situation, we need more job creators and not job seekers. So uh, probably uh, for us to create more entrepreneurs among both men and women, we will also have to work on the ease of doing business index, which we still are struggling to come into the top, uh, not the top 10th or the 90th percentile. Probably if there are some good practices from your government, uh, it would be nice for you know, the governments to share that and to ensure that more enterprises are uh, you know, encouraged to start up. Another area that uh, we can probably work on is uh, there is a skew towards infrastructure more in the urbanized uh, sections of the country. Probably rural, I mean, there should be more focus on the rural infrastructure, which you know, a country like Greece, I mean, I think almost 90% of your country is urbanized. So if we can actually get those learnings and ensure that we move towards a more urbanization of the rural areas, that will also have a, a, a ripple effect on creating new entrepre entrepreneurs or new enterprises. And finally, I think one area of collaboration is like Greece, India has a rich heritage and culture, 
And I think tourism has not been given that much of a focus, while Greece, I think, tourism is fantastic. And I think there could be a lot of learnings between both the countries where we could also enhance, and also a lot of cross-learnings happen between both the countries. Thank you so much. If you agree, I would suggest take one question for one minute from our audience. Yeah, I think there's you one lady already there. There's a lady at the back. So, just a question, not a statement. And could you, could you please take your name? I mean, we need, I'm sorry, we Is need a mic. mic. Because we have uh, some closing uh, remarks in uh, the meantime to do. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, so my name is Ma Mariana Wanta. Uh, I want to tell a big thank you for all the panel. I want to have a question for Mr. Uthu. In his presentation, he said that um, a big success of this uh, digitalization program, it was to, if I understand well, to um, be one alternative, let's say, to the financial system of MasterCard and Visa, and in this way, uh, the population in India, which I visit, I know the country, it is a wonderful country, uh, have more opportunities uh, in business or in um, everyday life. The question now for you, it is, uh, this it was a way how the, the country thinking um, to push this digi digitalization program in the new geostrategical um, system. I know about BRICS and something just like that, because we know that the reality in our history it is... One minute. Could you please... Yes, yes, yes. To make um, a difference is by the pushing of um, old financial system in the new financial way of life. Um, why I say I said that? Because I'm also sorry, we I here... I have to interrupt you because I, I asked you kindly to just have a quick question this it is, for one minute because... No, no, only one thing, only one thing to say. Here in Europe, we understand the way of digitalization. We like to be uh, the uh, solution against the, uh, how it is the, the bureaucracy. But in other way, uh, if someone put us to put all our eggs in the same basket, we here have the okay, feeling that... Thank you uh, so much. You take that the it answer. Is, uh, a, how it Who is say? going to answer? Okay. It's a question for me. Yes. Very, very quickly, um, let me answer this. You see, on one hand, um, when we talk about um, digitizing enterprises, now we could not have created 800 million card swipe machines and send that, them to every small, medium enterprise. So instead what we did, we figured out how do we make your bank talk to my bank without anybody in between, where you authenticate the debit I, somebody else authenticates the credit, and we just get it done between the two exactly. people without a third party. Exactly. That was the only intention. There was no motive of throwing out any Visa, MasterCard, or anybody else. And you can take whatever you, you have, you can take, I'm, I'm sorry to say, offline, just outside, mm -hmm. because unfortunately, Mr. Frank Richter is just saying, not two minutes, Finish it, because there is another panel still here. Uh, I have to say just a couple of words. I believe that uh, that was a very important and very powerful uh, panel, because I spoke about the real problems the two countries they have, although there is no comparison between the uh, the, the, uh, how big is one country and how small is the other country. But both countries, they are based on their cult culture, on their philosophy, and on the way they are progressing continuously, if you all agree with that. Absolutely. And I believe, and thank you very much for that, that was a great opportunity for Greece to have this event here, the, Greek, the Indian Forum in Greece, and this discussion, because we exchange a lot of views, and I, I strongly believe that between the countries, we continue 
the communication and how we can benefit. I have to thank each one of these great panel of mine and thank you for honoring me to chair this panel. Thank you very much and I hope that the audience took something from what we All said. All of us did. Hope so. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. This was a wonderful panel, Madam Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Minister and the panelists. Please um, stay seated, ladies and gentlemen. We have um, the Minister of Energy Transformation um, and Transition coming in a second, uh, joining us here in the main plenary room. And I would also like to call on Mr. Vagelis Xeniadis, the chairman and founder of We Square, to join us on the panel. Uh, his company, We Square, is very much focusing on real estate, having a session right after, and he is also a dear sponsor of this summit. Vagelis. Hello, hi. Can I please have anyone's attention? Um, I'm Vagelis Xeniadis, owner of We Square Development. We have the real estate plenary in Omicron 2 room, where we're going to be having a presentation and extending uh, the possibilities of Indian investors in real estate. So if you are interested in real estate and the Greek investors permanent residency permit, which gives access to 29 countries in Schengen through the acquisition of a permanent residency in Greece, please get us in the real estate plenary in Omicron 2. Thank you very much. Thank you very much in supporting us. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you. Please, come, come, come. Yes, please, please, please. Yes, please, please. 